Roger Sherman, Forgotten Founder. That's the topic of conversation on today's Brush Fires of the Mind, the Dave Benner Show, where we have but one lamp that guides our feet, and that is the lamp of experience. Madison, Hamilton, Washington, Jefferson, Jay. Among these names, Sherman is usually never listed when invoking commonly known founders. Uh, Certainly, a student of constitutional history will recognize that name, but many are still unaware. So I'd like to do my best today to kind of describe several ways in which Sherman contributed to the Constitution we know today. The Constitution that we defend is a compact to which the states were ratifying parties. Now, Roger Sherman was instrumental in at least four major ways when it comes to the Constitution. Really, without Sherman, it can certainly be said that the Constitution wouldn't even look the same way it does today, for a few reasons that I'll get into in a bit. Um, Usually, actually, when people ask me who are some of my favorite founders, I typically answer them by saying Jefferson, Mason, and Sherman. Thomas Jefferson, George Mason, and Roger Sherman. Now, everyone will recognize Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Less people will recognize George Mason, and even less than Mason will people recognize Roger Sherman. So that's the way I answer it. Now, sometimes I get the response when I say this, you know, Roger Sherman, who the heck is that? And that actually gives me a really good opportunity to elaborate what I like about this man, what I find admirable about him, and uh, why I kind of answered in that way. And just before I get into some of the ways, I just want to give you a very brief biography on Sherman. Um, Roger Sherman was born in Massachusetts, actually, just outside of Boston. He didn't really have much of a formal education. His education didn't really extend beyond his father's library and grammar school. But he became a shoemaker, actually. Um, He was known to have a certain aptitude for learning, though, and he definitely had access to many resources, including his uh, father's library. Um, His father actually died pretty young, and he and his family moved to New Milford, Connecticut in 1743, where he opened one of the town's first stores there. He also became uh, acquainted with religious studies and civics while there, um, and he became one of the town's leading citizen leaders. While he was there, he actually had no formal law training, but he was still admitted to the bar of Litchfield, Connecticut after he passed the bar Uh, purely through self-study. He was appointed to the Justice of the Peace in Connecticut in 1765 and the Justice of the Superior Court of Connecticut from 1766 um, all the way through 1789. But, of course, he left that um, to both be in the Constitutional Convention, the Philadelphia Convention, and later uh, the First United States Congress. Uh, He would then become a U.S. Senator where uh, he died while still in the term of George Washington's presidency. Now, Sherman signed the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution. He was only only one of, I believe, two founders that did that. I believe that the only other founder to have done that was Robert Morris of Pennsylvania. I could be wrong about that, but I think so. Now, Sherman was a guy that Thomas Jefferson called a man who never said a foolish thing in his life. So, Sherman was known to you know, think things through before he made a decision. He was known to really get into the specifics of things before he came to conclusions, and he was known for never kind of making a fool of himself. But he really was instrumental in four major ways when it came to the Constitution, and that's what I'm going to kind of get into right now. So the first uh, reason why he was influential was through his proponency for an Article Five Convention of States which would have the ability to amend the Constitution. Now, that eventually made its way into Article 5, but initially Madison didn't think that was necessary. Madison didn't think it was necessary for the states to be able to propose amendments, and the Virginia Plan didn't really call for any kind of mechanism that could change the Constitution such as that. Um, basically, when George Mason found out about this in Virginia, he chimed in and thought that was abominable, that the states couldn't fix the Constitution. He basically said that it would be condemnable if that couldn't take place. And really his reason was that, you know, what if the federal government is the the problem? You know, shouldn't the entities that delegated it, its own power, have the ability to uh, suggest its own amendments? 
Surely Mason knew that a body that clings to power rarely lets that power go. It usually just continues to consolidate power. And he argued that, you know, the federal government wouldn't voluntarily acquiesce from that power if it deprived it from the states. It wouldn't just simply voluntarily relinquish it back to the states. And Sherman kind of agreed with this. Um, you can see this in Madison's notes, actually, from the Philadelphia Convention. On September 10th, 1787, uh, Sherman moved to introduce an article to the text that would become Article 5. And that text said, or the legislature may propose amendments to the several states for their appropriation, but no amendment shall be binding until consented to by the several states. And also we can see here that James Wilson moved to insert three-fourths of before the several states, making it known that three-fourths of the states are needed before any amendment is ratified. And that was agreed to. Uh, really, Sherman and Wilson were instrumental in addressing the concerns of Madison and others, um, they realize that the states are parties to the Constitution, and as parties to the compact, they have the ability to have an alteration mechanism. Edmund Randolph of Virginia was another one that eventually uh, supported this idea. So that's one reason that Sherman contributed. Another reason is through the Connecticut Compromise. Now, this is sometimes called the Great Compromise because it was really one of the most highly disputed portions of how the construction of the Constitution transpired in Philadelphia. I'd like to give a little bit of background on this, um, just by highlighting some of the governmental models that were actually proposed before there was kind of a uh, this great compromise. Uh, James Madison and Edmund Randolph basically proposed the Virginia Plan. Now, Madison throughout 1786 to 1787 engaged in really a huge research project. Uh, what that research project was, was he studied past governments throughout thousands of years of human history to try to reach some conclusions about what is the best way to construct a government in which liberty can prevail. Really, what he ended up thinking of was the Virginia Plan. And really, his Virginia Plan was actually calling for quite a bit of national power. Um, really, it called for a bicameral legislature in which both houses were apportioned by populace. So there'd be like two assemblies like the House of Representatives today. Um, it proposed a judiciary that could rule on any case of perceived federal importance. So this really would kind of take away from the state courts. Um, it also proposed a methodology for the federal government to overturn state law. This was called a congressional veto, sometimes called a congressional narrative. Now, that was defeated, of course, and he would later lament this to Thomas Jefferson in a letter, but uh, that's a topic for a different uh, podcast. Um, in contrast to the Virginia Plan, New Jersey proposed a governmental model where each state would be equally represented in a legislature. They wanted to kind of replicate the situation like the Confederation Congress and the Continental Convention and, uh, before it, where each state was essentially equal and each state really had one vote, really. Um, that idea would actually you know, empower the less strong and less populous states like you know Georgia, Delaware, New Jersey, etc. Whereas Virginia and Pennsylvania and New York, you know, the strongest states would share the same relative power level. Now both of those plans were debated vigorously. The Virginia plan was debated mostly. But what was eventually decided upon was a compromise that was engineered by Roger Sherman and Oliver Wolcott of Connecticut. And this was called the Connecticut Compromise. What it did was it would construct a bicameral legislature in which uh, the lower house would be apportioned by populace, that's the House of Representatives, and the upper house would be delegated by two individuals, that's what we know as the Senate. In a sense, really, the Connecticut plan kind of blended the aims of New Jersey and Virginia into one platform, and that platform was palatable enough to get both states to eventually adopt and ratify the Constitution. So he really should be applauded for those efforts. Oliver Walcott, too, is also a very underrated and underappreciated founder. Really, in, in their way, you know, a legislature could be constructed that shared the interests of all the states, uh, those that were large, those that were small, those that were influential, those that were not as influential. 
So that's the second way. A third way that Sherman greatly contributed was that he really was a hard money warrior. And that's something that I always point out about Sherman when people ask me about him. You know, what's, what's the best quality this guy had? He really believed in the necessity of hard money. And really, how could you not? At that time, when the, the Constitution was being constructed, the critical period or the time in which the Articles of Confederation were effect was kind of plagued by a system in which the currency was rapidly inflating because you had uh, states emitting bills of credit, basically money printed on paper, and the federal government was printing money on paper. paper. It was called the Continental. And the Continental inflated to such an extent it was essentially worthless by 1781. So Sherman really backed hard money that's tied to a commodity like gold and silver. Madison agreed with this and wrote that restraints against paper emissions and violations of contracts are not sufficient. Really, another case that you know Roger Sherman attached his reputation to was the assurance that state governments could not print such bills of credit that rapidly inflated. He really fought vigorously for this, and he fought through the prism of Article 1, Section 10's text. So again, he collaborated with James Wilson on this, and it shows in Madison's notes that Sherman and Wilson moved to insert the words coin money and the words nor emit bills of credit nor make anything but gold and silver a tender in payment of debt. So basically what they were doing is in Article 1, Section 10, they were prohibiting the states from being able to coin money, that being a delegated role of Congress, and the ability to emit bills of credit. Um, Article 1, Section 8 you know, states that Congress has the authority to coin money. And that is a very specific legal term, by the way. To coin money is to associate money with a known valuable commodity such as gold and silver. You can see how, you know, the Federal Reserve has abandoned that principle today. But nonetheless, that was considered an axiom at that time. Now, the change that Sherman and Wilson proposed was done to specifically alter the situation as it was in Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation. Because, you know, if you have a chance, take a look at Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation because Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation actually make it acceptable for the state governments to emit bills of credit. That article sanctions that. Um, on August 28, 1787, Madison's notes show that Roger Sherman believed that this is a favorable crisis for crushing paper money. That meaning that, you know, the situation that's developed by rampant inflation, which dis is destroying the colonies, should make this, you know, an obvious improvement over the Articles of Confederation. He also noted that without such constraint, the friends of paper money would make, quote unquote, every exertion to get into the legislature in order to license it. The prohibition on the emissions of bills of credit was passed by a margin of 8 to 1, so Sherman fought hard enough for this to be included in the Constitution. Uh, the fourth and last matter in which Sherman greatly contributed was his attitude toward a Bill of Rights. Now, Sherman was once in a group, an initial group of nationalists or federalists, that didn't believe that a Bill of Rights was necessary. Uh, joining him in this sentiment was people that I've talked about before, James Wilson, uh, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison even. These individuals didn't think that a Bill of Rights was necessary, and Roger Sherman initially agreed. Basically, the whole argument was premised on the fact that, you know, we don't even acknowledge that the government has the ability to impede these types of liberties to begin with. So, you know, writing them down would be abnegated, absurd, unnecessary, superfluous. Superfluous was the words that James Wilson used in his state house yard speech in Pennsylvania. So Roger Sherman joined that mind frame at first. But eventually, as some of the Republicans, otherwise sometimes known as the Anti-Federalists, started to rally, you know, against the Constitution saying that, you know, we need a Bill of Rights, otherwise the government isn't going to relent. They're going to seize liberty from the people in this national plot. Well, when that started to happen, Roger Sherman started to kind of come on board to that side of the equation. 
But his biggest contribution in this regard was the fact that he insisted that the Bill of Rights that would be eventually be ratified by 1791 would not simply be text that was interwoven into the Constitution's actual text. And that was actually considered for a time. You know, Sherman insisted that these rights would be enumerated in a list that would be appended to the end of the Constitution rather than be just text that's interwoven in between. Really, the argument was that this would provide, you know, a quick reference, much like, you know, the English Bill of Rights did before it. It was a very quick reference that citizens can use to point to, um, to reference. Now, the amendment of the Constitution that Sherman was particularly insistent upon was the Tenth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment, of course, is one that notes that the powers that are not delegated to the United States in the Constitution are reserved to the states or the people. Now, he labored consistently in the committee that this amendment would be included. And remember, I've talked about in former podcasts where the states that ratified the Constitution often put that as the number one priority for a constitutional amendment. That was their number one priority, the number one a piece of interest that states had. And you can see that from the ratification text. It really is the most important amendment in the regard that it respects federalism. It really respects the fact that this government is not one that is built upon the unlimited submission to the federal government. Sherman was insistent that that be included. Now, with those four things, I mean, Sherman really contributed quite a bit. Uh, Sherman really kind of lacked the eloquence of some people, especially like Patrick Henry, who was known as the greatest orator of his time, and Thomas Jefferson, the person that was known to have you know, the most eloquent and beautiful pen of his generation. Um, but he was effectual. His methodology did work. It was adopted, and we live with some of those premises and principles today. As such, I don't think that he should ever be overlooked, and I'd love to hear him, you know, brought more to the forefront uh, when it comes to, you know, discussing issues when it comes to the early republic, the founding, and the constitution in general, because we have to appreciate this guy. You know, he was more instrumental than almost anyone else in the Philadelphia Convention. Now, Sherman didn't really have a prolonged political career in the general government. He passed away in 1793. Um, he did serve one term in the U.S. House of Representatives in the first Congress, and he was a senator until he died in 1793. Um, that might explain some of the lack of notoriety he gets, but really we should be you know, going back to the ratifying conventions and the Philadelphia Convention to see you know, just how instrumental this guy was. At the time of Sherman's death, Ezra Stiles, who was president of Yale College, wrote this, Sherman was an extraordinary man, a venerable, uncorrupted patriot, and that's how we should remember him. Frankly, it kind of mystifies me as to why he gets no adulation in comparison to the others, but he is important. A great book that I recommend reading about Sherman is one from Mark David Hall. Uh, Hall recently wrote a really good biography on Sherman called Roger Sherman and the Creation of the American Republic. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, that is the one of the better biographies on any of the founders I've read, and I couldn't recommend it more. So with that said, I would just like to tell people thank you for listening to this podcast. Please visit www.davebenner.com to get a vantage point into my blog, into my articles that I contribute to the Tenth Amendment Center, and every other piece of contribution that I'm making. I hope you guys love it. As patriots, we need to recognize that liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. The checks he endeavors to give it, however warrantable by ancient usage, will more than probably kindle a flame, which may not be easily extinguished. It's Brush Fires of the Mind, The Dave Benner Show.